nice introduction. Uh, good morning. I think this is my um, fourth visit to Adelaide. I enjoy my time always when I'm in Adelaide. Excellent city, excellent people, excellent wine. <laughs> so um, it is a great pleasure, great honor for me to have the opportunity to talk, to deliver at Prescott uh, speech deliver, uh, speech uh, presentation. Um, before I start with my presentation, I would like to thank my friend Owen, uh, Connexus Global, for the invitation, and also I thank very much Mike, my long-term friend, for the invitation. Uh, my talk today will focus on the zinc deficiency as a global nutritional problem in crop production and immune health. Uh, most of you know very well that zinc deficiency is really a global micronutrient deficiency problem in agricultural soils. There are a number of reports saying that uh, at least one third of cultivated soils affected from zinc deficiency. Uh, some of the countries which well known zinc deficient problem in, in soils, for example, Australia. There are some reports indicating that more than 10 million hectare area, cultivated area in, in Australia is affected from low amount of plant available zinc. In Turkey, nearly half of the cultivated soils have low amount of plant available zinc in the soil. China, India, other countries where zinc deficiency is several times reported in agricultural soil. This map shows the countries, the regions where zinc deficiency has been reported in cultivated soil. The orange region countries are known as the countries where zinc deficiency is a widespread problem in the cultivated soils. So nearly one third of cultivated soils affected from, from zinc deficiency. The question is, why is zinc deficiency so widespread in, in cultivated soils, in agricultural soils? There are a number of physical and chemical factors which, which affect the solubility uh, of, of zinc that exists in the, in the soils. For example, high calcium carbonate, high clay minerals, low organic matter, low soil moisture. All these factors reduce the chemical availability, solubility of zinc in the soils. We have other soils which have absolutely deficient in zinc, particularly sandy acid soils, which have absolutely low amount of zinc. But most of the soils have sufficient amount of total zinc, but a major part of this uh, total zinc is, is not available, chemically soluble or chemically available to plant roots. We have another problem in terms of zinc nutrition of the crop plants, intensification of farming also cause zinc deficiency through uh, depletion of zinc in the soil, mining of zinc, and also through dilution of zinc in the harvested part of the plants. So this dilution and depletion of zinc through intensification of farming, through uh, release of high yielding cultivars contribute also to zinc deficiency problem in, in agricultural soils. What happens when you have zinc deficiency? Of course, when, when, when the soil is deficient in zinc, the plant growth is, is very much affected. And not only the growth and development is affected, also nutritional quality is affected. So you can find zinc concentration in grains of plants growing on potential zinc deficient soils, let's say around 20 ppm or 15 ppm. In central Anatolia, we have very severe zinc deficient soils. And the zinc concentration in the grain growing in central Anatolia is around 10 ppm. It's really extremely low. So having zinc deficiency in the soils uh, cause two, two main problem uh, concerns. Uh, number one is the poor growth, poor development. And number two is the poor nutritional quality uh, uh, of the grain that you harvest. So why plants are so susceptible 
to low amount of zinc in the soils. You know very well that zinc is very critical micronutrients needed for protein biosynthesis, for protein function. We know that nearly 10% of the proteins in biological system need zinc for their structural function, for their structural integrity. So 10% proteins mean nearly 2,800 proteins need zinc. It's a huge amount of proteins need zinc. And zinc is an is, uh, important micronutrient that is needed for structural and functional integrity of biological membranes. You know, this function of zinc is very important in terms of disease tolerance of the plants. When the membrane are leaky under zinc deficiency, then you get high amount of exudation of organic compounds from cells into rhizosphere, which increase the uh, pathogenic infection. So membrane function is, is also very important in terms of disease tolerance of the crop plants. Yeah, zinc is well-known micronutrients in terms of the detoxification of reactive oxygen species. There are a number of reports indicating that that plants, cells, accumulate huge amount of reactive oxygen species, particularly spheroxide radicals, because of uh, two reasons. Number one, zinc is needed for spheroxide dismutase enzyme. Spheroxide dismutase enzyme is enzyme that detoxifies spheroxide radicals. This enzyme is zinc-dependent enzyme. And number two, you know, there's an enzyme which produces generate free radicals, NADPH oxidase, superoxide generating NADPH oxidase enzyme, and this enzyme is also highly sensitive to the presence of zinc. Under sufficient zinc supply, this enzyme, the activity of this enzyme is low. And under zinc deficiency, there is an increase in the activity of superoxide generating NADPH oxidase. So zinc is also a very important micronutrient that is needed for, for biosynthesis, but also for protection of, of oxygen from free radical dependent oxidation. And zinc is also an important micronutrient for better pollination. So I have a one uh, uh, film uh, that show uh, how zinc affects the growth of, of um, wheat. Uh, we have um, a zinc nice zinc deficient soils in, uh, when I find this file, uh, and when you grow the plants in, on this, in the zinc deficient soils, you can get very poor growth. I think you're right with this one, is it? This uh -huh. one? Is that this one? Uh, maybe you can see. Uh. Yeah, yes. yeah. So um, we grow the plants in a zinc deficient soils with low, moderate, and adequate zinc supply. The plant was wheat. And uh, here on the right side, you see the plant age. So. Um, <coughs> Uh, this soil is from Central Anatolia, having a DTPA acceptable zinc around 1.1 ppm. It's very low, extremely low. So uh, after three weeks or four weeks, the plant development, plant growth is very significantly affected from low supply of zinc. You see already in uh, day 40, uh, the symptoms of zinc deficiency in the wheat and plants have around 10 ppm, 11 ppm zinc in this uh, example. And ad the plants with adequate zinc supply contain around 25, 30 ppm zinc. <coughs> and uh, you see the tillering is affected, grain formation is affected, remember pollination effect, uh, the, 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 the contribution of zinc to pollination, grain setting, grain formation. So finally, uh, the yield under given conditions reduced by factor two because of uh, zinc uh, deficiency. And you have poor growth, less yield, but at the same time, you have low amount of zinc in the grain. So nutritional quality of the grain that you harvest from, from soil with low zinc is very low. And you know zinc deficiency also increase phosphorus uptake. You know, this sort of very well, zinc deficient plants absorb more and more phosphorus and this converted to phytate. So under zinc deficient condition, you have low zinc in the grain and high amount of phytate. So nutritional quality of the seeds that you produce on potentially zinc deficient soil is really very, very low. 
try to imagine if the people consume such type of weeds, grain, over many years, the body and the children develop very quickly zinc deficiency problem. Not only just because of low zinc, but also a very high amount of phytate. So, and we know that zinc, is, zinc deficiency is also a well-known problem in human populations. So, we know up to one-third of world population, two billion people is affected from zinc deficiency. Globally, uh, particularly in the developing countries, we have this uh, uh, zinc deficiency malnutrition problem. And children are particularly susceptible to zinc deficiency. One report uh, uh, published in Lancet showed that 450,000 children under five years old die just because of zinc deficiency. 450,000 children under five years old die just because of zinc deficiency. And there is very uh, close relationship, geographical relationship, linkage between zinc deficient soils and zinc deficient incidence in human population. Particularly when you look at India, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where you have zinc deficiency in the soils, you get also high incidence of zinc deficiency in human population. The problem is huge and well recognized. There are, uh, number of international efforts to minimize zinc deficiency problem. International efforts start by World Bank, by World Health Organization, UNICEF, Gates Foundation, Bill Clinton Foundation. All these international organizations have different type of programs, efforts to minimize, to alleviate zinc deficiency problem in human populations. And particularly, as I said, in, in the developing world. The question is, what is the, what is the reason the main uh, the reason of such high incidence of zinc deficiency in human population. Remember, one third of the world population affected from zinc deficiency. Nearly two billion people, mostly in the developing world. And the main reason uh, is related to the low dietary intake of zinc. I think you know very well that the cereal grains inherently very low in zinc concentration, in iron concentration compared to dicots, compared to animal-based proteins. So in the rural areas of India, Pakistan, China, Turkey, in Africa, some South American countries, the contribution of the cereal-based foods to daily calorie intake is very, very high. Up to 75% of the daily calorie intake comes only from cereal-based foods in the rural parts of the developing countries. It's a huge amount of cereals are being consumed. And these cereals inherently very low in zinc. Remember my initial slides of statement. Today we have uh, nearly 30, 35% of the cultivated soil have zinc deficiency problems. And when you grow the cereals on such potentially zinc deficient soils, you further reduce zinc concentration in the grain. Even in Australia, in Germany, in the United States, in Canada, we have zinc around 20, 25%. It is not enough to meet, to meet, um, to meet human demand, human requirement for zinc. So zinc concentration, when you when you try to measure zinc concentration in the, in the grains collected from Turkey, Australia, India, China, we can find a variation between, let's say, 10 and 30 ppm. It's very low. In, on uh, the grain which, which harvested on potentially zinc deficient soils have 10, 50 ppm zinc, 20 ppm zinc. It's really very low. So our challenge is to, to, to increase, to, to boost the, the concentration of zinc in the, in the cereal uh, cultures, you see here, for better zinc nutrition of human population, grain zinc concentration, is, grain uh, should contain around 40, 50 ppm, or 60 ppm zinc. And one of the reports published by Robin Graham saying that nearly 50% of the cereal cultivated soils have zinc deficiency problem. 
So cereals inherently are low in zinc. When you grow these cereals on a potentially zinc deficient soil, you reduce further zinc concentration in cereals. So what is the solution? to zinc deficient in the human population. They are really very effective solution approach to the, to the problem. For example, supplementation, really very effective. Or you can artificially enrich food with zinc by adding zinc oxide or zinc sulfate in the flowers. But you know, although these are methods really very, very effective, but not sustainable. Try to imagine in India, in Punjab state, <coughs> rural areas, you cannot give every three months zinc tablets. You cannot provide zinc enriched foods in order to minimize daily, every day zinc enriched foods. It's, it's, it's expensive. It's not affordable in those countries. Although these uh, methods uh, approach really effective, but, but uh, uh, applicability of those uh, uh, approach is not easy in, in the developing countries. So agriculture offers uh, sustainable, uh, simple um, solution to that problem. You can, for example, develop new serial genotypes having high genetic ability to absorb zinc or iron from soil and accumulate or deposit the zinc in the grain. There are nice genetic variation for zinc, for iron. I mean, genetic variation for grain zinc, for grain iron. This excellent, this impressive genetic variation for zinc can be exploited through breeding. Or transgenic approach also offer uh, excellent um, option to to contribute zinc density, iron density of the of the uh, food crops. And agronomy, I mean, fertilizer is additional or complementary approach to, to, to the problem, to minimizing zinc deficiency uh, problem in the human population. So I think you know very well there is a Harvest Plus Biofortrition Challenge program. This program uh, focuses on, on breeding of new cereal genotypes with high micronutrient concentration and with high uh, vitamin A concentration. This program is, is, is a breeding program. We use classical breeding. There is also some uh, nutritional genomics uh, program that mainly this program focus on classical uh, breeding. And there is a significant progress, impressive progress, is being made under Harvest Plus program. There are some limitations, although breeding is really most powerful, sustainable, cost-effective solution to that problem, but there are some limitations. For example, breeding, you know, is a long-term process. And uh, the stability of the high zinc trade is, or high iron trade is also very important, I and mean, stability in different location environments. And newly developed genotypes should be able to extract sufficiently large amounts of zinc from soil. Therefore, we, uh, we need a, uh, additional or complementary, not separate but complementary uh, approach to, to this uh, breeding program. I will come to that point. And transgenic approach also represents excellent option in improving food crops with zinc and iron. So when you look at the literature, there are a number of nice papers, excellent papers, which uh, show that the uh, um, transgenic approach uh, is, is highly promising approach to develop lines with high zinc and iron. But when you look the papers more carefully, uh, in those publications, in those papers, uh, no data on grain is given. Uh, I think this, this information is very critical information. We need this information. But most of the papers, I don't need to tell you which papers, even in science and nature, published. Sometimes I, 
it is a big surprise for me how the referees accept such papers without yield data. And therefore, it is, it is sometimes it's difficult um, to assess any potential dilution and concentration effects on the reported changes in grain, zinc, and concentration. But anyway, transgenic approach, I have to say, also a very uh, important tool to contribute to zinc and iron concentration. But it doesn't matter which genotype you have, transgenic or non-transgenic lines. Let's say you are successful to, to develop new genotypes through classical breeding or through transgenic approach. Still, you need high zinc in the rhizosphere. Our challenge was to double grain zinc, increasing from 20 ppm to 40 ppm. But still, we need zinc in the rhizosphere. So uh, a successful breeding program or transgenic program for biofortifying cereal crops, for example, with zinc, depends on the amount of plant available, sufficient plant available zinc in the rhizosphere, in the soil solution. Remember my slides, there are a number of physical and chemical factors in the soils, like high pH, like low organic metal, low soil mo moisture, high amount of clay minerals, iron oxide, aluminum oxide, all these are factors reduce the availability, solubility of zinc. And therefore, at the end, you will need again some, some fertilization, or some amount of uh, pools, available pools of zinc in the, in the rhizosphere. So with this, I am coming to agronomic biofortification. So application of zinc fertilizers offers a rapid solution to problem and represent an important complementary approach to ongoing breeding programs. So my talk today will focus more on the, on the agronomic biofortification. You know, breeding is a kind of genetic biofortification, application of fertilizer represent um, agronomic biofortification. We have a project, global zinc fertilizer project, under, uh, established under Harvest Plus program, Harvest Zinc. And this program supported by different organizations, mainly by Harvest Plus, but also uh, different fertilizer uh, institutions, companies, and also uh, Bayer Crop Science, and the programs are uh, coordinated by, by Sabanji University. So we have trials, zinc fertilizer trials in Mexico, Brazil, Zim Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Australia, Thailand, India, Pakistan, China, Turkey, Kazakhstan. I will show you some, some slides and some results from those experiments, but some pictures to get just impression about these trials in Zambia. We, we, we use maize, rice, and wheat in our program, we try to, to, to um, uh, test different zinc formulation fertilizer. We try to uh, apply zinc at different time, at different forms, at different rates in order to uh, identify the best zinc application method that contributes high, uh, significant to grain zinc. And we have trials in India. Our trials focus on maize, wheat, uh, and rice. We have in Brazil wheat and uh, maize, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Pakistan, Mozambique, China. We have also zinc day events for farmers. We try to increase the awareness about the importance of zinc nutrition for crop plants, also for nutritional quality. And we had uh, in China uh, zinc day, in India, in Thailand. This zinc day is mostly for the farmers and for crop consultants. Uh, and the program uh, had different presentations, starting from zinc in soil, finishing uh, zinc in human nutrition, human health. And all presentations made from the local people, from local uh, uh, scientists, or uh, uh, people from the governmental organizations. And we had in China, nearly 300 farms attended. And last time uh, in Brazil, next Zinc Day events will be in India on 2nd March, in Pakistan, Canada, Zambia, probably near future in Australia. 
So I will try to give you a few examples, results from the ongoing harvesting project. Um, here, uh, effect of uh, zinc application on wheat grain yield in seven countries with 14 locations over two years. So based on the trials in seven countries with 14 locations over two years, zinc application improved grain yield around 5%. This is the average of, 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 uh, of the trials conducted in seven countries with 14 locations. But you know, the main aim of this program was increase the zinc concentration, the grain. And when you look at the grain zinc concentration with and without foliar application, we had trials in India in six locations, Kazakhstan, two locations, Pakistan, four locations, Mexico, Turkey, Australia, Grand Lines contributed to this part, and Germany, Iran, and Brazil. And the zinc concentration, average zinc concentration in 10 countries, with 32 locations, is 25, 26 ppm. When you spray zinc sulfate, zinc to foliar, you can double the grain zinc concentration. I have to say, all plant breeders, molecular biologists, dream of this nice increase. But you can do this just by spraying zinc sulfate, uh, and you can very easily contribute to, to increase in, in grains in, in wheat. So the question is, uh, now, you know, uh, most of the zinc, I think you know very well, most of the zinc located in aluron part, in embryo part. The endosperm part is very poor, very low in zinc concentration. So our challenge is, and the, uh, also the challenge of the breeder or molecular biologist is to increase zinc in the endosperm part. That is the, mostly, uh, the, the most important part that we eat. But normally, when you, uh, when you uh, analyze the zinc concentration, uh, for example, the embryo and aleuron, uh, the brand part is the, it, it's very rich, it's very high. You can find 50 ppm, 100 ppm thing, but in, in the endosperm part, it's very low. 8 ppm or 10 ppm. So, we, we conducted, uh, we made an experiment, uh, another example from my lab, zinc particularly located in the aleuron part. So our challenge, our aim is how, what we should do to, to improve zinc concentration in the aleuron part, uh, sorry, in the endosperm part. This is the part that is mostly eaten. So we had an uh, experiment. We applied zinc sulfate at different growth stage, before flowering and after flowering. And we monitored the zinc localization by using ICPMS. Now I would like to show you the results. This, and we, we have looked the zinc localization along the entire cross-section of the seeds. This is the white arrow. And we looked at the zinc concentration in the, black, in the endosperm part. This is the black arrow. Okay? You see in the seed codes, vascular part of the seeds, you have high amount of zinc. But in the endosperm part, in the seed, in these exams, 2 ppm. It's really very low. So what happens when you apply zinc before flowering and after flowering? So let's focus on the endosperm part. In this example, zinc concentration, when you don't apply zinc, is, is, is around 4 ppm, 5 ppm. When you apply zinc at stem elongation and booting stage, you can easily increase the zinc concentration from 4, 5 ppm up to 10 ppm, 8 ppm. It's a nice increase by further application of, of zinc sulfate. <laughs> but when you apply zinc, after the flowering time, during the milk stage and dog stage, you see the increase is much higher. Up to 15 ppm, you can increase the zinc. It's a nice increase. Impressive increase. I mean, you increase the zinc in the endosperm part that we eat by factor 3. This is, I think, very important for human nutrition, for human health. Also, you will see later on for the seed germination, for the seedling fever. Most of you know very well uh, Increasing zinc in the seeds is, 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 is very important for seed quality. Most of the knowledge or results have been produced in Adelaide, in Wake Institute, published 10 years, 15 years ago. Increasing zinc is not only important for human nutrition, but also for seed health, for seed quality, uh, for better seed germination, and better seed figure. 
So increasing zinc in the endosperm in this case has a number of benefits. Benefits for human nutrition, also benefits for uh, seed uh, quality, seed germination. So in this project, in our seed project, we have also seen an excellent contribution of nitrogen nutritional status of the plants to, to seed zinc. So <coughs> here I have some results. And our results, was published in the last two years uh, in uh, different journals, say that, that nitrogen is a really a critical player, actor in root uptake, shoot transport, and seed accumulation of zinc and also iron. So which deserves a special attention in biofortification programs. And there are, you know, uh, very critical steps in, in absorption, transportation, and seed deposition of zinc and also iron. All, at all these are critical steps, we need direct or indirect nitrogen. So for example, mobilization and uptake of zinc, there are different process, parameters which involve in, 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 in those process. For example, we need transport of proteins to mediate the uptake. We need phytosiderum force to mobilize zinc in the rhizosphere. All these are compounds are nitrogen-dependent compounds. All the transportation of zinc from the roots to the shoes. We, you need some chelators, nitrogen-containing chelators. All the uh, retranslocation of, of zinc, phlegm transportation, uh, also depends on different nitrogen-containing compounds and protein synthesis storage proteins in this case also attract zinc. So all, in all these steps, we need zinc and uh, uh, nitrogen. So one example here from field, this is a field trials. We grow the wheat with low nitrogen and high nitrogen. You can see here, in case of high nitrogen, you have always a little bit more zinc. 32 ppm, 37 ppm, 51, 58, 57, 64. I mean, always 4, 5 ppm, 6 ppm more zinc. In some cases, by high nitrogen, you, you have also more yield, meaning that harvest zinc is higher. So at the same time, by increasing nitrogen nutritional stress of plants, you improve the yield. At the same time, you increase the zinc concentration in the grain. It's a nice, nice effect of nitrogen nutrition. And same effect we have, we know, those uh, published by uh, Glenn McDonald's, he showed that there's also sulfur contribute very positively to accumulation of zinc in the seeds. So sulfur and nitrogen really important player, component in whole story to contribute to, to zinc concentration of the grain. So I have some short-term experiments to, to show you how, how zinc absorption, for example, affected by nitrogen uh, application. Here you see the plants first grown with low and adequate zinc, and then we may conduct a zinc uptake experiment. You can see here zinc um, uh, absorption is stimulated, root absorption is promoted by nitrogen nutrition. Nitrogen was particularly affected in the root to shoot translocation. I mean, absorption is stimulated, but also root shoot transportation is also stimulated. Same effect with iron. This is very recently published in uh, uh, plant and soil. You see here, by increasing soil nitrogen supply, you can increase the shoot iron concentration. Same picture with zinc. Also, total amount of iron per plant. You see here, the effect on iron content much more than the iron concentration. And I think you know very well phytosiderophores, the cereals, most of the cereals release phytosiderophores under zinc deficiency and iron deficiency in order to mobilize, absorb zinc and iron. And we, we ask whether this phytosiderophore release process is affect from the nitrogen nutritional state of the plants. So we made some experiments, we grow the plants under different nitrogen nutrition regime and we analyze the phytosiderophore release. And this is also very recently published. And you see here, by increasing nitrogen nutritional status, the plants release more and more phytosiderophores. And we made a, um, a test model uh, experiment. We uh, radio labeled uh, iron hydroxide. 
and put this iron hydroxide in dialysis tubing, as you see here. And we grow the plants with low nitrogen, medium nitrogen, and high nitrogen. And we wanted to know whether phytosiderophs are able to mobilize iron from this iron hydroxide and whether these phytosiderophs also uh, later on absorb, taken up by the rules. And we made this experiment with the plants with low nitrogen, medium nitrogen, and high nitrogen. You see the mobilization, I mean the release of phytosiderophores, mobilization of iron, and absorption of iron, phytosiderophores is, is, is stimulated by nitrogen uh, nutrition. When you make this experiment morning, you see the effect. Right? But when you make this experiment afternoon, you cannot see effect because afternoon the plants cannot release phytosiderophores on the mornings. So uh, another student made an, an experiment. He grew the wheat plants with uh, uh, under low and sufficient uh, nitrogen supply, and he analyzed uh, plants at seven growth stage. He wanted to make a balance, a distribution of things in the grain, in the stem, in the tiller, spikes. And I sh will show you only one result from this uh, experiment because there are there's so many data. And this slide shows the distribution of or partitioning of zinc and iron in plants with low and high nitrogen supply. Please pay attention to the grains. When the plants grow under low nitrogen, the allocation of uh, the, 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 the iron that is uh, transported, allocated to the grain, is 38% of the total iron. When you increase the uh, nitrogen nutritional seeds of the plants, you increase allocation of iron to the seeds uh, from 38 to 60%. Same for zinc. With low nitrogen, uh, on this 59, around 60% of the uh, zinc exists in the grain. When you improve the nitrogen nutrition status, you increase the deposition of zinc in the grain. So it seems um, the, the, the high, high protein probably is a zinc for zinc. And here, uh, when, uh, remember this uh, uh, staining, this is a protein, uh, particularly located like zinc, like iron, Protein also located mostly in the allurum part and in the embryo part. In the same location, compartments, you have also high zinc and high iron, probably. When you increase the protein density, protein concentration in the grain, you attract more zinc, more iron. There's another explanation, might be another explanation, why high nitrogen nutrition contributes to high zinc and high iron uh, accumulation. So, last part, I have three slides and I am finishing. Um, I am moving to uh, changing subject a little bit. Uh, I think you know very well, OS8 has, has a number of eight programs uh, in the development world. And uh, I uh, learned recently that Australia is planning to spend $4.8 billion on development assistance. So, near the $5 billion huge money this is the uh, budget that is uh, proposed for 2011-2012. You know, there are sometimes, not only in is, is, uh, Australia, but also in Canada, in EU countries, in the in, um, <coughs> United States, uh, the discussion is about whether these eight funds, these are whether these uh, eight monies is being used effectively, correctly, in those uh, uh, countries. So this is also a discussion in, in OS8. Uh, uh, of course, everybody give uh, good efforts, uh, pay special attention to use such monies effectively and correctly. So from that point, I am coming to um, an issue uh, to do Australian weed. You know, Australia is, is the second or third biggest, uh, largest country in terms of wheat export. So as you, see, you see here, this is the estimated figures for 2011. Australia looks, seems to be second important uh, country in terms of wheat export. You know, part of the wheat that you produce exported to the developing world, where you have zinc deficiency problems. 
Today I have a suggestion to you, uh, to, um, uh, and, uh, I mean, my suggestion today is a pilot zinc fertilizer program, fertilization program, can be developed. A part of our soil and wheat could be biofortified by zinc, and this biofortified wheat could be exported to the countries, regions where zinc deficiency is a critical problem in human population where Australia has already a program. I think this is a this is very um, good way to contribute to human nutrition. You produce the wheat in Australia, you buy biofortified wheat in Australia, and ship this zinc biofortified wheat to, uh, to uh, countries where zinc deficiency is really a critical problem. Or only a selected region let's say selected region in Vietnam, a selected region or village in, in, in India, only to those regions, selected region, uh, village, uh, zinc, biofortified wheat could be shipped, exported, and in parallel to that study, uh, and human study could be conducted to, to follow uh, health impacts of the zinc, of the usage of the, cons cons uh, of, the uh, uh, of the zinc biofortified wheat on on uh, uh, development of, for example, children. So this is a suggestion, and as I said, uh, biofortifying Australian wheat with zinc could be an excellent contribution to human nutrition development. So thank you very much. seminar. Do we have any questions from the audience? Vlad, the first. You showed a graphic early on uh, which indicated the distribution of... Sorry? You showed a graphic earlier on showing the distribution of human zinc deficiency across the world. Given that Australia and the US probably have similar diets, I'm curious why Australia was shown to, to have moderate incidence where the US was low. Uh, in Australia, we have uh, soil zinc deficiency. Uh, I think there is no zinc deficiency, and the incidence of zinc deficiency in human population is not, uh, it, it is not the problem, it is not the case in Australia. You mean this slide? Um, this uh, there are some reports that the, 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 ch the children and elderly people have also a deficiency problem in Australia. In UK, in the United States, 12 percent of the 12 uh, percent of the EU population, for example, is affected from low intake of zinc. Uh, the susceptible groups of human beings are more children and elderly people. But there are also reports I know which, sh which show that uh, zinc deficiency is not a uh, uh, critical problem in Australia because diet is rich in animal-based proteins. Although we have zinc deficiency problem in soils in, uh, in Australia, although Australian wheat has low zinc, but the contribution of animal-based proteins in diet is very high. And I think the role of uh, wheat in daily color intake around 15 or 20 percent in Australia while 75 percent, uh, 70 percent in the rural parts of India. So some reports say that the, the problem, uh, human safety problem is, is, is not an important problem in, in, in Australia, but there are other reports saying no, the some, uh, children and elderly people affected from diet, uh, from zinc deficiency in Australia. Good question. We, in this house zinc project, we have seen, also in Turkey, in the previous studies, we have seen soil zinc application contribute to the zinc content of the grain, but the contribution is, is really less. Let's say you increase the zinc content from 20 to 25, 26 ppm. They increase only a few ppm. But in case of foliar application, they increase dramatic. I mean, you can double. 
So uh, in case of soil application, you improve, the, you correct the zinc deficiency nicely. Right? Let's say you have zinc deficiency problem. To, to, to avoid, to correct the zinc deficiency, you have to apply zinc to the soil. But in case of foliar application, we consider foliar application as an approach to contribute to nutritional quality. And the best solution is one soil application combined with foliar application. For, to increase the grain zinc, we have to apply foliar lit zinc. So soil, soil application is not sufficiently uh, effective. To increase sufficient amount of zinc in the grain, we have increased, but this increase maybe is good for grain development, but not sufficient for human nutrition, for human health. Yeah, I agree with your points. Yes, if you apply really too much nitrogen, that is not the case here. You can induce such type of problems. The, the, the examples that I gave, presented today, is low zinc, sufficient zinc. Uh, sorry, low nitrogen application and sufficient application. I mean, we are still in optimal, uh, acceptable uh, nitrogen rate. Of course, when you apply too much nitrogen, you can get additional problems, not only for the nitrogen, but also for other elements. Too, too much, anything is always a problem. To biofortify zinc by foliar application, you don't need too much I mean, nitrogen. Nitrogen contributes to the story, okay? Still, under low nitrogen, of course not nitrogen deficiency, uh, low nitrogen, you can stimulate, promote the zinc accumulation in the brain by foliar application. Uh, probably you have seen uh, the paper published last week in plant breeding and uh, last year in crop science, which showed that GPCB1 protein has some effects under growth chamber condition, greenhouse condition, I mean in transgenic line, but when you go to field and Washington State University research, I mean a research group in Washington State University and CIMIT scientists in Punjab Agricultural University and also CIMIT people in Albatan, in Obregon, they showed that GPCB1 gene has no any effect, significant effect. Forget the signal, I mean, even Dutkowski is short, we could increase just to 3 ppm. So GPCB1 is, is a gene that is not so helpful to contribute to zinc concentration. Even the people from Israel, they say GPCB1 gene only responsible for 5% of the total protein. But this message is not so good written given in the publication, the, 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 the impression is GPCB1 is responsible for all proteins. No, only 5, 10%. This is therefore not surprising when you look at the recently published paper in plant breeding last week that show GPCB1 protein has no effect on grain zinc or on iron, even there is a little bit yield decrease with protein gene. Yes. That's 
Good point. Um, <coughs> probably in near future, yes. Uh, we will pay more and more attention to the nutritional quality. I mean, wheat with less cadmium, less arsenic, high zinc, high iron, high protein. The time will come probably, but you, you are right. The farms never motivated. It's difficult to encourage them, difficult to motivate them to spray zinc. But you know, most of the farmers spray fungicides, insecticides, commonly. I don't know the situation in Australia. And we have uh, also in our, on the Harvest Zinc Project, Harvest Plus uh, program, some trials uh, investigating the applicability of zinc together with commonly applied fungicide insects in a given target country. And the results show there is no antagonism between the zinc and, and, and fungicides when you spray together. So, okay, farms are not, uh, are not uh, encouraged, or there's no motivation for them to spray zinc, but they can apply zinc together with fungicides to, to contribute to zinc concentration. And if you, if you demonstrate to the farmers that, they, that using seeds, having high zinc, uh, provide better agronomic performance during the early growth stage, because we know this from the literature, literature that the seeds with high zinc germinate better, develop better, tolerate the environment stress factor. This could be also one motivation for farmers to produce high zinc seeds. Um, uh, you mean we collect the root exudates and you mean there are also some other uh, uh, compounds? I, I, yes, good point, but remember my slide, when we make the same experiment, afternoon, oh, um, afternoon there is no any mobilization. Yes. Yeah. So meaning that the, the, the mobilization that we have caused by practicing therapy. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, maybe Michael could help me in the answering of this question. To my knowledge, there is no concern with zinc mining, with zinc depletion. I mean, any depletion of zinc could be very easily, nicely uh, recovered by, by producing, uh, using this zinc uh, mining, uh, mining uh, area, uh, zinc from the zinc mining area and producing sulfate or zinc oxide or other zinc uh, uh, fertilizer. You know, the, the, the amount that we apply is really very low. So three, two kilograms, three kilograms zinc sulfate per hectare. I mean, in contrast to phosphorus and uh, potassium, uh, nitrogen, the, the, the amount that we apply is very little. So in case of soil application, you don't need to apply zinc sulfate uh, every year because of residual effect, you know. But for nutrition, for nutritional quality, I mean, to, to increase the zinc in the grain, we have to spray every year to foliar. But in case of soil application, you don't need to apply zinc sulfate or zinc fertilizer every year because the residual effect is very good in case of zinc. Five years, six, six years, you don't need to apply zinc again in case of soil application. So there would be not a problem concern with, with zinc. Uh, Following on from that, um, do we know, uh, given that zinc obviously can't break down, do we know what the destinations of the zinc what percentage goes, it gets taken by the plant, and where does the rest go? Uh, if you mean the soil application, soil uh, uh, in, uh, I mean, from our studies in Anatolia, the eight, ten percent of the zinc is absorbed, like phosphorus. Mm -hmm. So we apply ten times more uh, zinc than the plants need, because you know, zinc very quick absorb and fix. One of the master study uh, students who made an experiment, he applied normal rates of zinc sulfate to our calcareous soils. He couldn't find, I mean, he made an absorption experiment. He couldn't find any, any zinc. All zinc very quickly absorbed. Then he applied one ton. I mean, one ton is never applied. Just to understand what's ongoing, 98% of zinc very quickly absorbed, fixed. 
So in, in therefore the zinc deficiency problem is really a common problem in the calcareous soils and in soils with low organic matter. And the recovery of the zinc fertilizers, eight person, the eight person, like even seven, six, it's not high. So there is very good fixation, absorption of zinc that you apply, like phosphorus. Okay. Um, over here in the first. What? Soft drink. 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 Soft at least for Turkey, I have to say, the zinc deficient incidence, when you look at the diet, yeah, the diet really very poor, very low in zinc concentration. But when you look at the incidence, it's just feeling. I, I have no any evidence, just feeling. Yeah. Uh, the incidence is lower than I imagine. And the reason I believe related to the transportation water in the pipeline that is made from galvanized pipeline, you get a little bit of zinc. Probably the same here. I don't know how water is transported to the home, home house. Probably galvanized pipeline is used. You have always a little bit of zinc every day. Yes, you are right. You, you get every day some zinc through water. It's not ionized water that we drink. It's some zinc available in the, exists in the water that we drink. Okay, well, we'll take three more questions, then we might break for tea. Petra, Mozen, and Dagwine. So, Petra, you have your hand up first. Yeah, um, I've got a question regarding, you mentioned that phytate reduces the bioavailability of the zinc. So, even if you increase the grain zinc concentration, is this zinc then really bioavailability, or it just goes just go yeah. through the, the human body and just disappears again? Very good question. Uh, it is still a Big question for us, for Harvest Plus. Yes, you in, when we increase the zinc through breeding or through agronomic tools, what is the bioavailability? So there are some bio studies on, on animals. It's being done. Uh, the results not yet available. But uh, when you increase the uh, zinc concentration, this is a very important point. When you increase the zinc concentration, Particularly in the endosperm part, yes, here, you know the phytate concentration, very high like zinc in embryo and allerone part. There's a big gradient in phytate concentration from the seed coat to the endosperm. When you increase the zinc concentration by factor 2, 3 in the endosperm part where you have no phytate or very little phytate, you have very high pool of bioavailable zinc. So no chance for fight it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think uh, zinc application uh, can contribute to increase the level of resistance uh, of lung to some disease? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, zinc is very critical micronutrient needed needed for the structural integrity of the biological membranes. Under zinc deficiency, membranes are leaky. The membrane paramaps increase under zinc deficiency. They release uh, carbon containing compounds, uh, organic compounds like amino acids, like uh, sugars, and these compounds are excellent substrates, feeding substrates uh, for, for pathogens. So, zinc deficiency by increasing root exudation may increase the pathogenic infection. And this is one of the main reasons why zinc deficient plants are susceptible to infection. One of the main reasons. Oh, this is, uh, you know, the, in greenhouse we use, we apply 
uh, 5 ppm zinc is a sufficient, I mean, 5 milligram zinc per kilogram soil, I mean, between 2 and 5 milligrams zinc per kilogram soil is a sufficient rate for greenhouse experiments. In soils, 20 kilogram up to 50 kilogram zinc sulfate per hectare is a sufficient rate, but in case when you would try to produce zinc deficiency, you have to come down less than 0.5 ppm zinc in greenhouse experiments if you have zinc deficient soil. I mean, this is very variable from greenhouse to other kinds, it's very local. I mean, depend on the which institute you are, and depend on which soil you have. Glenn. Um, Ishmael, your, your early work in Turkey had tremendous impact on um, application of zinc fertilizer to cereal crops and increasing yield and zinc concentration. Did that have any measurable impact on the health of rural populations in Turkey? And has anyone actually followed that up in terms of uh, school? Uh, very good point. Unfortunately, we didn't do this. We expected the, the Minister of Agriculture, Turkey, and Simit wanted to make such an impact study to see w w what is the impact of usage of every year 400,000 tons zinc containing fertilizer in Turkey. Every year we apply 400,000 tons, 1% 1 zinc containing NPK fertilizer. But what but, but, but we know, just an answer to your question, uh, I miss zinc deficient soils to make trials in Turkey, number one. And number two, because the farmers, when they, uh, when they ask uh, nitrogen fertilizer or phosphorus, they say, please give me a fertilizer that contains zinc. Zinc is well known among the farmers. They apply every year one uh, person zinc containing fertilizer, but they also know when they apply zinc sulfate only, they don't need to apply every year, every four, five years. But another uh, uh, parameter is that, that uh, uh, to your, uh, the answer to your question is the seeds that we collected before the start of the zinc fertilizer project early 90 years in Anatolia in many areas, always 12, 15 ppm. Right now, the concentration, most of the grains that you collect from Anatolia around 15, 18, or 20 ppm. I mean, we cannot find seeds that have 12 ppm zinc so me, that we had before 90 years. So we have some increase in the grain, but it would be fantastic to make an impact study what, what is the contribution of this usage of zinc fertilizer in, in, in nutrition or human health by measuring blood zinc or hair zinc. Now it's terrific to have such a large and enthusiastic audience. And uh, I invite you all to join us for morning tea at the, um, in the tea area at the back of the room after the seminar and an opportunity to um, pose further questions to Ishmael. Now, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank Mike McLaughlin, Matt Gillingham, Annie McNeil, and the Soils Group for organizing the seminar. And most of all, I'd like to thank our speaker for an excellent seminar and a really fascinating presentation on the role of zinc. And I've got a small token of our appreciation, mm -hmm. as is our custom. We have oh. <laughs> <laughs> a rather dodgy cowboy box, but uh, two, bottles, two rather robust bottles of uh, weight wine. And what else have I lost? <laughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> So we've got uh, two bottles of wine made on late campus for you, um, and also a plaque which commemorates the occasion and thanks you for giving us such an outstanding Prescott lecture this year. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.